Good morning. Good morning. I am very happy to be here and very happy that we have such a terrific turnout. As Jody was saying, I am um, Dolores, or D, Dr. D as they call me in Vermont. I'm the uh, medical director for the Department of Corrections uh, for the state of Vermont. And I don't know how many people here are medical directors for departments of corrections or providers within departments of corrections, mid-level, docs, whatever. Um, could you just raise your hands if you are any, or nurses? One, two, three. <laughs> I wish there were more, because I think uh, this, is, this is a place where those of us who provide care on the front line, I'm more administrative at this point, but I've been with the Department of Corrections in Vermont for seven years. I, prior to that, I worked for UMass Correctional Systems Services in Massachusetts um, for about four years. And back when I was a nurse practitioner, also spent some time providing care in the uh, prison system. So I have a long history of incarceration, periodically. <laughs> Jail and prison sentences. And I've enjoyed every minute of it, uh, despite the fact that sometimes, as we all know, these are the folks who are first to sue us, and that's why we have bunches of attorneys general and uh, other people who help out with that. Uh, that is going to happen no matter where you practice in, in healthcare and certainly in corrections. So that does not uh, daunt me, it didn't steer me away. So I've been involved in Vermont for seven years and, and really happy to be there. And uh, when I first went, I thought, when we first moved to Vermont, my husband, whose birthday it is today, he's sitting in second row, happy birthday. Uh, <laughs> I had to say that. It was nice enough to come with me on his birthday. So uh, when we moved there and I took the job in the, in the Department of Corrections, I thought, piece of cake, 1,600 average daily population in state and 500 out of state. In Massachusetts, I was one of four um, statewide medical directors for the state, I think we had 18,000, 10,000 incarcerated and about 18,000 under some sort of total supervision, parole, pr probation. And uh, it was busy and I took call and um, worked in the infirmary and did all of those things. So I thought, 1,600, I'm gonna be the medical director. Got it covered well. <laughs> if you've ever heard anything about Vermont, um, our system, we are a unified system, as it is Rhode Island. There are about six states who have unified systems, prisons and jails um, combined. Vermont is one of those, and people who um, come to Vermont, who study our system, who work within the system, who consult in the state of Vermont, usually say something to the effect, yeah, Vermont's really unique, <laughs> which is kind of code for oh, how did you develop this? But uh, that is what we are, and it is challenging, uh, very stimulating. It's a great place to work. So as far as the Affordable Care Act and how it is impacting what we do and the services that we provide and how we can provide those services, I liken it to a perfect storm. Now, if you know anything about Vermont, you know that in 2011, we suffered a hit from Tropical Storm Irene. That was a perfect storm in an imperfect sort of way in terms of the damage that it brought into the state. The flooding, lives that were lost, homes that were damaged, people who were displaced, it was horrific. Out of that came the term Vermont Strong. And the governor at that time is our governor now, still, Governor Peter Shumlin, and um, he could see immediately, as could um, everyone, that this was something that we needed to react to and act quickly about. It was an emergency situation. It was a crisis. And once again, unfortunately, Vermont is facing another crisis, which is indeed quite um, a storm in itself. As, uh, just about every other state is as well. And that is the crisis of opiate addiction, drug addiction, 
um, the numbers of people who are incarcerated as a result of that or who have um, addiction and co-occurring disorders as a part of their, um, their history and, in fact, their reason for being in, in prison and in jail. So with that, Governor Shumlin, during uh, the time that he gave his State of the State, declared another emergency. We have a crisis. We have a public health crisis in Vermont, and that is the public health crisis that is facing all of you as you sit in the audience. When you go back to your states, you know it's there. We all know it's there. It's the crisis that has come about because of addiction, because of poverty, because of all of the other negative um, factors, negative things that are, are happening. Kind of that, again, that imperfect storm. Uh, we've had um, how many years now of having an economy that bottomed right out, that people who were on the edge flipped over into the, the deep crevasse who are still trying to climb out. And many of those people, if you were already marginalized because you are part of the criminal justice system, well, you are certainly marginalized now. The governor, in declaring our state of emergency, moved to provide more funds for treatment of people who are addicted, moved to help the rest of the state to see that these folks are our neighbors, they are our friends, they are our brothers, our sisters, our family members. Um, and that they need help, and they need help right away. He proposed several different um, strategies that one would see and are useful when you're experiencing a crisis, a public health emergency. You need to quickly act. You need to make sure that there are enough funds to support the efforts that you are about to undertake. And the governor put additional funds through the budget adjustment into the treatment of opiate addiction. He also uh, wanted to, going forward, uh, in addition to the funds that he had already, um, had, had already been appropriated, to make sure that we were going to leverage all the possibilities in what is now a perfect storm of good things happening. That we could leverage the fact that we now have rapid intervention that we are now in the process of making sure we have acts and bills in place that are moving their way through the legislature, which will make it possible for uh, assessments to be done pre-arraignment, pre-trial, so that we have adequate court diversion programs, so that we have adequate mechanisms for treating people when they feel the need uh, when they feel that they are ready for treatment. And any of you who, who know about changing and stages of change in people's lives and the whole notion of whether you're quitting smoking, quitting drinking, or quitting drugs, that you have to be ready. And that readiness can kind of come and sometimes it waxes and wanes, but you must be ready for those people who are feeling that they are uh, close to being uh, able to say, I, I need to be treated, this will impact my life. You have to have the ability to treat them where they are. The ability to say, yes, come on in, rather than, why don't you come on back in about 10 weeks? Most people don't do well with that. So making sure that you have those interventions in place and that you're able to accommodate uh, the people as they arrive on, on your doorstep is very important, and the governor recognized that. The other thing the governor recognized was that the other part of our perfect storm is indeed the Affordable Care Act, because it makes it possible now for th those persons who were previously not going to be covered by um, health care or weren't able to um, participate in Medicaid are now a part of the expansion. And so we now have mental health and substance abuse on par on par, actually, with physical health treatments. And why wouldn't we? It's, it's been, always been very strange to me that we could kind of sort out our mental health side from our physical health, our diabetes or our heart disease, or that we could sort it out from substance abuse issues in our lives, which affects almost everything it does. It affects everything you do. It affects your home, your family, all of it. The other... Um, 
good thing for me as the medical director of the Department of Corrections is having a governor who recognizes that, having a commissioner who recognizes the uh, need to leverage what is within the Affordable Care Act, and we were doing that long before. When I first came to Vermont, I thought, yeah, easy state, I'm gonna, I have this wrapped up, only 1,600. I'm going to go out and start doing something called um, making connections for corrections, which really was for me about connecting with all the people in the community, particularly federally qualified health centers, where I worked in Massachusetts for eight years. And knowing that the, the FQHCs and the CHCs have what it takes to do the job, to do the work with people who are coming out of corrections. They're used to taking care of disenfranchised populations, populations that live on the margin, populations who sometimes don't make it to their appointments on time, but still need to be seen because they're on a different kind of a time for whatever reason. Some of it cultural, some of it because of where they live if they are homeless, and all of those, being able to um, look at people as individuals and as a population. So having that perspective, having the support, and also having the support not only of my commissioner or the governor, but the, um, all the branches of state government in Vermont are really uh, on board when it comes to knowing what the Affordable Care Act, the, the potential is uh, for uh, corrections, really, and the, and the Affordable Care Act. Now, it was interesting in listening to Elena talk about the messiness in uh, Rhode Island. Vermont is experiencing also some of that messiness, but I think I've been doing this since, I've known this was coming since 2011, and have tried to make myself, um, uh, put myself into various places on several different committees where the need would be for those others on committees, my colleagues in the Agency of Human Services where we're located, the Department of Corrections in the state, to recognize that corrections needs to be at the table. Whenever you are planning something for healthcare, medical homes, blueprints for health, hubs and spokes that um, deal with uh, substance abuse issues, that if, you're, if you don't have someone for, from corrections on the table, you're missing a large part of your population. And you're missing a large part of your population who happens to have some of the highest needs and some of the most intense needs for services and care and some of the um, highest risk for uh, falling into the crevasse and never coming out. So in Vermont, we started to recognize that in 2011 and had it written into the legislature, legislation for health care reform for inmates when we took a look at, uh, with our house corrections and institutions, the act was called the War on Recidivism. Within that act was a tiny piece, big enough though for me to kind of use as a wedge, that says inmates in Vermont need to be included as part of health care reform. And we started it there and we've continued with suspension, working on the suspension rather than termination of benefits. We have it now as a rule and on, uh, with DIVA and Medicaid, working with the integrated eligibility. I sat on the procurement uh, committee for uh, statewide for the MMIS for Medicaid to make sure that the system understood what the statuses are, what it means when someone is on probation, on furlough, on parole, and incarcerated. So there's lots more to tell, but I've been given the signal that it's time for me to shut up and sit down, so I shall. <laughs> Thank you.